Hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to another live event of the MIT MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. Um, I'm Miguel Rodriguez Garcia, a researcher at the MIT Center for Transportation Logistics in Boston, and I'm the course lead for SU1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. This is the second live event uh, of the Spring Series, which is a series of cross-course live events for SU1X Supply Chain Fundamentals and SU3X Supply Chain Dynamics. Uh, something that we do every year, twice a year, during the spring and the fall. So I've been doing these events for a while now, uh, but today feels a little bit different. Uh, after years of always co-hosting these live events with the SC3X course lead, today I'm the only host, uh, but for good reason. So the reason is that today we have the privilege of welcoming our own Jeff Baker, uh, the course lead of SC3X, as our speaker. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today as our main speaker and contributor. So how are you? I'm, I'm doing great, Miguel, and, and thanks a lot for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's great here to be with you. Um, as Miguel said, I am the uh, course lead for SC3X and uh, absolutely love the opportunity to come here, share some insights about uh, demand forecasting in this live event. It's something I speak about and write about internationally, topic very near and dear to my heart. So I'm really excited, Miguel. Nice. Yeah. So we just want to remind everyone that uh, this event is part of the MITx MicroMasters program being SEM, Supply Chain Management, a program that we developed here at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, and as well as Supply Chain Fundamentals uh, and Supply Chain Dynamics. The MicroMasters program includes three other courses, uh, so five courses in total, and some of them are currently open for enrollment. So don't hesitate to, to check them out. We'll be posting the link in the chat group in case you guys are interested in completing the program, which we definitely encourage you to do. Uh, so today's session is gonna focus on improving uh, your forecasting skills. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, he is an expert on this matter. Uh, and you guys know that forecast errors are costly for those taking SC1X. You're pretty familiar with this and you're working on it right now for those taking SC3X, probably you have if you had done SC1X, you, you know uh, the topic already. But many companies made their forecast worse when they unintentionally bias, uh, like override uh, of the original forecast. When they use that, they sometimes, well, things happen uh, that they don't expect. And so Jeff will be sharing uh, like ways to avoid this kind of behavior. And yeah, super interesting topic. Uh, but before going into the presentation, Jeff, why don't you share a little bit of your background? And like, because they know you as the SC3X course lead, but uh, probably they don't know what else you have done in the past, which is a lot. So, yeah, no, great. Thanks, Bill. Certainly happy to do that. So, uh, I've been a consultant in supply chain management, uh, specifically in the area of SNOP and demand management. Uh, for about the last 25 years, I kind of hate to remember what that number is, but yeah, it's it's, it's been a while. Uh, really, in the last 15 years, really almost solely concentrating on SNOP and demand forecasting. Um, I was in the first uh, group of students, much like yourselves uh, in the audience today. Uh, I was in that first group that went through the very first uh, MicroMasters program, even before there was a MicroMasters program. Uh, so I got my MicroMasters, was also in the first cohort to go to MIT. And then it was kind of natural that I, I take my passion for, you know, demand management improvement, and I did an engineering uh, thesis. Uh, so uh, that was quite exciting uh, to do that at MIT. Uh, so in addition to consulting and, of course, being the course lead, I'm also the column editor for uh, Foresight, the International Journal of Applied Forecasting. And I, I edit the uh, forecasting practice column. Uh, so it's an area of my passion. So I'm really excited to be here, Miguel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm sure our learners are super excited to, to uh, learn from you today. So the agenda that we are going to follow is the same as always. Uh, first, Jeff will give us a presentation that will last around 25 minutes, and then we'll open uh, the room for questions. So I'll be channeling all those questions for you guys from the audience to, to Jeff, and we'll have uh, like 10 to 15 minutes to do that. So please, I encourage you to uh, participate and use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Do not use the chat but for uh, asking questions because it's going to be hard to track. So please remember you have a, a Q&A feature uh, on the bottom of the screen uh, for that. So um, with that, I think uh, let's get started. Jeff, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Thanks, Miguel. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is mitigating biases to improve forecast accuracy. As Miguel said, there's a lot of people that touch the forecast. Once we have a perfectly good statistical forecast, they touch it. Oftentimes they make it worse, and I want to kind of dig into why that is. So here is the agenda. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is 
we override forecasts way too often and it's expensive. So this is not just a, an academic problem. It, it's actually a profit loss type of problem. And so I've developed three rules and I'll go over each of these rules about how to start to mitigate that. The times when we manually intervene into the forecast cause a forecast error increase. So there's a value degradation there. And then I'll wrap it up uh, for, you know, you know, summary and then Q&A. Hopefully we'll have a, a good amount of time and definitely looking forward to your questions in this. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, what does a typical SNOP forecasting process look like? So normally we wait for the month to close, you know, so right now we're in May. So last month, you know, we, we waited for April to close and we were able to generate a stat forecast for May. So we generate a stat forecast. Then we use um, some of our expert opinion oftentimes to override this. So we would manually adjust that to create a final forecast. And this is the forecast that the rest of the company will use is what that final forecast is. However, in a good forecasting process, what we also want to do is we want to measure that forecast error. And I'm going to suggest that weighted MAPE is an excellent metric for you guys to get started with. But I don't just measure it on the final forecast, guys. I measure it at each step of the process so I can see what the evolution of that error looks like over time. So, for instance, a naive forecast is, hey, I'm, my forecast this month is going to be the same as it was last month. So there's a naive forecast that isn't actually associated with it. We ought to be able to add value by creating a stat forecast like you learned about in 1X, right? You generate that, and then you've got an override. Well, I can measure the weighted MAPE at each of these steps and come up with a differential between how much did I add or subtract. So in this case, my naive forecast would have been a 48% weighted MAPE. The statistical forecast was 38, so I added 10 percentage points of value. I mean, proved it, but then I overrode it, and it went from the 38 to the 46. So I actually degraded overall accuracy by 8%. And you might say, Jeff, like that's crazy. Like no one, no one does that, right? The problem is, in a lot of cases, um, it's it's very prevalent, right? So in my research, and so this is some of the this work from my my thesis work, I looked at several different companies, and I've since continued to add on to <clears throat> the number of uh, you know businesses I've looked at, but I find this is prevalent. And so you know we see that companies with a hundred hundreds of forecasts. They override most of their forecast. They touch everything. Um, but the problem is, you know, you see over there, only 40% truly add value to the forecast. That makes it worse in most cases. So the problem is there's no value added. We're increasing the bias of the forecast. We're hurting the forecast accuracy. And I'll get into the next slide. Of like, this is actually an expensive thing to do because we're impacting service levels. We're impacting inventory levels, all kinds of cost implications for a poor forecast error. And so that, that graph in the lower right is, is one that's very interesting because what it says is based on the size of the override. So I look at the total amount of times I've overridden a forecast. I take the, the 25 smallest and then the next 25 and then all the way up to the 25% of the biggest forecast. And what we find is some curious behaviors there. One is you can see about <clears throat> almost half of those, I'm, I'm not really doing much of anything. So those are time wasters. But look at the ones on the right-hand side of the graph. What I see is a lot of times when I override it, I'm actually making the forecast error worse. Very interestingly, the, the bars that go up that add value are the negative overrides when I actually take the forecast and bring it down. And I'll talk about why that is, but think about why that would be that if I dial up the forecast, my accuracy gets worse. And if I dial down, the forecast uh, gets better. So, so think about it. We're talking about the overrides. I'm oh, sorry. So that that's sorry. That's the that's the graph I was uh, talking about. I got a little, little bit ahead of myself there. Okay. So again, the ones that are here on the left hand side of the graph, those are the ones that are, are basically the time wasters. The ones on the right hand side of the graph are the ones that we're impacting the forecast. Sometimes the better. Again, the negative overrides when we drop it down, and we're making it worse when we turn it up. So think about why that uh, why that might be. Okay, so forecast errors are expensive. So if I look at the cost of forecasting, so about $1.7 million per billion dollars of revenue come from over forecasting, right? If I over forecast, I have price discounts, I have the transship, and there's a lot of costs associated with that. Excess inventory, excess you know, warehousing, a lot of holding costs associated there. On the flip side, if I under forecast, I see, okay, well, I've got lost sales. I've got case fill fine. You know, some companies will fine you if it's not on time in full. 
right? So you get fines there. We have to expedite shipments. We have to change our production schedule. So there's costs there. Now, interestingly enough, if we know those costs, we're like, well, why is the more expensive one more prevalent? And if Mr. Spock were there, he'd go, curious, you, your, your overrides are completely illogical, right? <clears throat> so it doesn't make sense. And especially it doesn't make sense to us. Most of the people here are in the MicroMasters program. They take an SE 0123, hopefully take forward in the final. But it doesn't make sense to a lot of us like why this behavior happens. And so the question then becomes, what rules should guide us? This behavior happens, it's real. How do we mitigate against that? <clears throat> so the first rule, do no harm. And no, that is not a misquote there. Don't just do something, stand there, right? So it was from Edwards Deming who said, you know what, we have a human desire to go in there and change things. We can't just take what the machine puts out. We got to change it. We have to tweak it. The problem is that that adds a lot of problems. So rule number one, do no harm. So do not override the statistical forecast, right? If it's already forecastable. So if there's already a very small amount of error, the chances of you improving on that error are negligible. You are more likely to harm that than you are to make it better. So therefore, don't touch it. If it's already accurate, just let it go, okay? The next thing, if it's a B or C item. So if you do a Pareto analysis, so segmentation is key here. If I've got products that are low value, like you got to be real careful that I really want to spend time making adjustments to a bunch of C items. And you might improve the forecast by a ton, right? But it may not make a difference financially. So you need to be judicious. If you're going to go in there, spend time and effort overriding something, you want to make sure there's some value associated with it, right? Um, so again, every override should be vetted to some degree. It's very difficult to just kind of say, okay, I'm just going to override the forecast. You need to kind of dig into it a little bit more. So this, I think, is the reason for the behavior in the previous gap, the graph, where we said the negative overrides actually increase the error. How many of you people have ever tried to decrease a forecast in an SNOP meeting? I will tell you, it's one of the hardest things. Everyone wants more, more, more. And if I come in there and go, no, you know what, guys, the forecast is actually going to be 5% less. I'm going to have to fight tooth and nail. That override is going to be very thoroughly vetted. However, if I just arbitrarily go in and say, hey, you know what? 10% increase. Everyone's like, yay, 10% increase. It just happens to match with the annual operating plan. It's everyone's happy. No one thinks about it. We move on, right? So there's the degree of vetting of these that is key. And I think we are much more prone to do that with the negative overrides, hence the behavior that we see uh, in that past graph. Okay. Um, so this, I think, is an interesting area for, for, for AI and machine learning. So for all you people, uh, maybe that kind of dates me, but that's uh, Space Odyssey 2001. And that is, uh, if, if you remember how the computer... Dave wants to override, open the doors, and the computer says, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't let you do that, right? And so it's an idea that maybe we can use machines to help us, to protect us from, like, you're going to hurt yourself, don't do that. And that's what my thesis, uh, a lot of it was about, is identifying those areas where there's a high probability you're going to hurt the forecast, don't do it, okay? So that's that's rule number one, do no harm to the forecast. Now, the second thing, rule... Um, is based upon the fact that error really has two components to it. We don't just measure error. What we really have is a component of bias and variance. Those two are related. And so if you really want to get into the, you know, the, the mathematics of it, the mean square error is equal to the bias squared plus the variance, which is the standard deviation square. So it's the combination of those two. What that says, though, is that for any error, there's really an infinite combination of bias and variance that will contribute to that error. So the fact that we do have these two factors also suggests we really need to explore both of those. We can't just look at error by itself. We need to look at bias and bias and error, and we can kind of intuit what the, the precision is. That's the, the harder of the two to get to. Um, but if we do that, if we look at the, the bias and the precision, what we're really trying to do is more of a Six Sigma approach where we want to be on target, 
with minimum variation. So on target means no bias. I'm not consistently high or low. On target means minimum variation. I don't have a lot of variation going on. So that's really what we want to do. And then we can start to do root cause analysis where we actually see deviations from that. So that's kind of at the heart of the second and the third rule. Because what's not intuitively obvious, if you look at the, the mean absolute percenter, the weighted mean absolute percenter, we take an absolute value, right? That's, that's the way we're able to, to scale it. But two overrides can give you the exact same forecast value. And so assume, let's say we, we, we get our data, we do a stat forecast, all right? And then eventually we say, hey, you know what? One person thinks, hey, that it's going to be that direction. So I've got two people override, two different opinions. One is O, and that's standard. Well, this one, in this example, it's going to be over-adjusted. M is maladjusted, and I'll get to that in a while. But we could have two different opinions about what to do with that stat forecast override in two different directions. Now. If we look at that and we look at the difference, and now we get the actual. So that's the number just popped in. And if I look at the difference, again, forecast minus actuals, if the override forecast O, it's A minus O, and the lower one is A minus M, those two numbers could be the same, right? Mathematically, it is identical. However, completely different implications about what kind of feedback you want to give to the person doing the override, right? If I've overridden it, that means I went from the statistical forecast, I went past what it actually was. I, I way overshot it, I over adjusted it. That's an issue of I need to work on the magnitude. How am I interpreting the signals that I'm getting? What's caused this irrational exuberance of like, I really think it's going to be much higher because we want to be able to temper that back. So that's one type of a problem. Um, the other type of problem is this maladjust. It's like you just direct, you went in the totally the wrong direction, right? And that's a challenge because that means you're misreading something, okay? It's either a misread of what, um, you know, the business factors, the environment somehow. Um, it could also be some blatant bias. This is one we see a lot, that adjusting in the wrong direction. If it just so happens that wrong direction is positive and it just so happens that makes it closer to the annual operating plan or the salesperson's quota. So that's where we get some of the, the personal bias creeping in. So if we understand this, we can start providing that feedback loop um, to start to combat you know, some of these biases, okay? The third rule I've got, so we talked about bias. Now we're gonna talk about the variance. And this is where uh, I'm gonna go all the way back to SC0X where we learned about the triangle distribution, one of my favorite distributions, because talking about variance is tough to people, especially if you're gathering input from sales, from marketing, perhaps people who don't have a technical background, they don't understand variance, right? Um, they do understand best case, worst case, most likely case. That's something that a lot of people can wrap their head around. So therefore this is good because you can start to implement this, okay? The beautiful thing about the triangle distribution, it's really easy to interpret this. Again, best case, worst case, most likely case, but it also allows us to start to question the people. So, okay, you think the forecast is gonna be you know, C, why is that the most likely one? What are the things that balance that make this, this middle average the most likely one? You can also explore the best case and the worst cases. So <clears throat> you can start to ask, what would happen to be, what would have to happen for this to be true? Like what has to happen for this best case to be true? What has, has to happen for this worst case to be true? And if you start to look at that, you can start to understand what are the risks and the opportunities, right? Because if it's higher, uh, either I guess either one of them could be a risk or opportunity, but everything has an upside and a downside. If we've got this this case at B at the upper right, what it, what, hap what happens if that that occurs? Well, what do we do if it's it's all the way there on the left to A? So we can start to talk about what to do in each of these cases. Now, oftentimes what you'll find is salesperson, a marketing person, they're giving you the best case scenario, guys, right? They won't tell it to you, but that's the best case scenario. That's what they're they're hoping for, right? Ask them about the most likely, ask them about the worst. And the, those are the tough to have. I'm going to ask a salesperson, what is the, the, the worst case scenario that's going to happen? I'm asking a marketing person launching a new product, what's the worst case scenario? But that's where we can start to really understand what the drivers are of the forecast. We can understand what some of the biases are from the salespeople, from the marketing people. When you start to 
uh, to counteract those. And the other thing, um, it's also a matter of trust because a lot of times the sales and marketing people, they'll forecast in the high side because they don't trust supply chain. They don't trust operations. They've been burned before, right? And so there is also making sure that this upside <clears throat> is communicated, you know, to the, the operations team so they can start to take, you know, actions to, to mitigate that. So that's uh, the supply chain team. <clears throat> and for the, uh, for the one X people, you know, it's, it's this buy the variance. That's the variance that goes into your safety stock calculations when you're figuring out statistical safety stock. So that's rule uh, number three in terms of minimizing, uh, mitigating the bias. So, I know we we had about uh, 20, 25 minutes to to do this, so I'm going to kind of grab some final thoughts here. Um, as I'm you know speaking to the audience, I'm going to guess most of us are Spocks. When I put up the the Mr. Spock thing uh, right at the very beginning, probably a lot of people very much resonated with that. Yeah, we we are technical. We're here at MIT. You know, we're learning stats. We're learning mixed and general linear programming. We're learning Holt Winters, you know, exponential smoothing models. We're in supply chain dynamics. We're, we're, we're talking about system dynamics. Um, we're very technical. Most of the world is not. You know, we, we, we talk about it. We have some, some, home, some Homer symptoms who want their donut, and it might be a donut or it might be meeting their sales quota or successfully launching a new product. Not to say that they're bad, but they're different ways that they think about things. And we can't just sit there and hide behind our numbers and say, well, this is this is what the model says. Like, you know, they don't understand what the model is even doing, let alone what it's forecasting. So really beyond the mathematics of it, like we're we're intense in the mathematics, beyond the mathematics of it, we need to understand how to how to counteract some of these biases that we've got. And so you can imagine there, there's one type of bias. Um, it's it's termed prospect theory. But it's the idea is if you find something, if I find 20 bucks, I'm happy. If someone takes 20 bucks away from me, I'm going to be steaming mad, right? And it's about a 4X factor. Think about that in terms of a salesperson, a lost sale, right? That's what it feels like to them. So that's why they're trying to protect against that pain, right? And so that is a, a bias that's very, very active. You know, think about a bias, you know, groupthink where everyone wants to hit the annual operating plan or the budget. And so the, all it takes is one person to say, you know what, I think the forecast is going to be here. And all of a sudden, everyone else is like, yeah. And in fact, it's really difficult to, to, to temper that down because you actually, you know, all of a sudden you're the, the person who is, who is negative, uh, you know, doesn't think it's going to happen. For me, I find it easy. I started off my, my first uh, several years as a chemical engineer I'm very risk adverse. If I think something's going <laughs> to, you know, happen in my chemical process, I'm trying to mitigate those biases. So I'm thinking through all the worst case scenarios. So being able to think through is a, is a critical skill to have. And in fact, many uh, companies, if they're in a consensus meeting in sales and operations planning, they'll actually designate someone to be the counter voice. It's like, we're all going this direction. You know, I'm going to pick someone. You come up with a reason why we're going in the wrong way. And so it starts to surface these things. So the behavioral biases, <clears throat> it's a whole fascinating area that is great to look into. Um, so again, if I'm going to summarize my my three rules, one is do no harm. If you can, limit the use of overrides. You want to make sure you don't let bias even have a chance to get in. So if I limit it to high value products that are not very forecastable, I think about that quadrant, that's where my value is going to be, right? Right. Let's work on those first. That's really the area where you've got a lot of chance to, to maximize business value because we're degrading the forecast by overriding each and every item, right? So um, don't give bias an opportunity to get in. <clears throat> and then when you do do your overrides for the ideally high volume, low forecast abilities, difficult to forecast, um, you know, I love this, this, uh, you know, this quote, good judgment is based on experience. Experience is based on bad judgment. And so we need that feedback loop. That feedback loop is not a negative thing per se. That feedback loop is what we need to make ourselves better. Um, so we can do that by reducing the bias. Um, look at things. If we've over-adjusted it or under-adjusted, look at what's driving those. Don't just say you were wrong. I mean, that's a, one of the oldest truisms of forecast. The forecast is always wrong. Great. Tell me how I can make it better. If I'm just giving you there, 
I'm not helping you out much. If I tell you about reducing bias, reducing variance, now I've got something that I can um, I can actually hang my hat on to make improvements in. So <clears throat> with that, looks like we're at the bottom of the hour, hopefully just about on time. And I would love to open it up for questions from the audience. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Jeff, for, for sharing so many uh, amazing insights. I, I have many questions myself, actually. <laughs> but also we have... a. Uh, already like more than 10 questions from from the learners so um I, i'll start with some of mine and then we will go through okay. um some sure. of these things because i think it's important uh, for the context uh and of what we do in se1x and uh, like really interesting uh insights so first of all i love the uh, financial aspect that you brought um you, you talk about you know the the time that people spend in in overriding sometimes this some of these forecasting in products that are not even that relevant, like uh, those like BC long tail uh, products that is kind of like, okay, is it really gonna make a difference? Uh, even the, the time spent on, on the process is not even, uh, you know, uh, valuable. But so yeah. that's uh, super interesting. Then we had several questions, um, uh, for example, from Kevin uh, Pills and other people asking about the reasons why people modify the forecast. I think you gave some, um, like some insights there mm -hmm. at, at the end about like why, why salespeople feel, yeah. you know, that, that they have to meet certain uh, like goals uh, and like how they feel about, for example, like, okay, if I lose a sale, like how bad that can be, you know, is it like for, for some people. I'm yeah. gonna give you the flip side because I've also experienced it in, in my own uh, work uh, that incentives matter a lot. So even for, for a sales team, for example, uh, you talk about, you know, the, usually you're going to go to someone from the commercial side and they're going to give you the best case scenario. Uh, if their incentives, uh, for example, are um, like meeting a certain goal, uh, what I've uh, seen uh, previously too is that they are going to under forecast everything because that way they always meet the goal. So in that case, that's a bias in a different way, but, but it's something that happens a lot on the retail industry, for example, in terms of uh, meeting certain uh, like you know sales goals and it's like okay yeah I'll always give a little bit less of compared to what I know I'm gonna sell because that way I'll meet the the goal and I'll have my bonus so but yeah. but it's crazy because uh, like some of these reasons why uh, like people modify it forecast and and do those uh, things so just wanted to um, add something there and yeah okay. absolutely yeah we 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 definitely see <clears throat> especially when it comes time to set the sales quota absolutely correct there's there's a lot of bias in the other direction that that kicks in so yeah a lot, lot lot of opportunity for biases to creep into your entire supply chain definitely so i'm gonna um uh, and... am i back yeah you're back sorry lay like, soon Quit it unexpectedly. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this has never happened before. But yeah, it's you know we we even at MIT we have technical issues sometimes. <laughs> uh, like we're back, so that's the important part. And um, so I wanted to to ask you a follow up question. Um, yeah. so in terms of uh like companies that still believe in the the human touch, you know, I I wanted to ask your experience when the environment, you know, that companies are operating in changes radically. And we, we saw it with COVID, uh, and for yeah. example, because forecasts uh, kind of like started like losing uh, like accuracy right away. Sure. And then uh, I'm familiar with, for example, the collectible world. And what happened in that world uh, is that um, for like a couple of years, there was a lot of like uh, cash in hand basically because people couldn't do any uh, anything so it's, they started buying like expensive uh, like uh, watches and other stuff so mm -hmm. basically the um the sales went through the roof but of course the environment was not a normal environment and then during that time they overproduce uh and now like after uh like we went back to normal um uh, if you will like they they have tremendous overstock uh, all over the supply chain and and so how do you think you know this human touch uh, can actually sometimes be useful for like touching the forecast how, when did you say okay now we we do need to trust in ourselves because something has changed like how did you uh, input that yeah i mean so usually if you think about a model if i've got a an exponential smoothing model 
I'm I'm looking at a level and a trend and a seasonality. So if there's anything besides level and trend and seasonality, then well, now I need some input. And so the the first thing that often comes into mind is okay, well, what about promotions? Like, great, we can model promotions. We have models where we can model, hey, we're doing a promotion here, a promotion here, and model that layer that on top to of an exponential smooth model. And so it becomes a, a kind of a a cycle where I ask what does the model already know what's already taken into account in the model and what's help happening outside that the model does not know about if a competitor goes down um if we uh you know ha have some you know social media influencer that loves our product well these are things you know we haven't seen it in the past we may not see it in the future if we see it in the future it's not going to be the same thing anyhow and so that becomes all right what else looked like this? How how can we build upon what an override should be? So either the model has it or the model doesn't have it. And then let's talk about, okay, well, what do we know about similar times when this happened before? And again, all of this is also predicated on, on good data. And that's probably yeah. one of the biggest challenges that we've got now is, you know, people think machine learning will solve everything. And you ask them, well, what kind of data do you have? And they don't have the data. Well, it's hard to generate stuff with with incomplete data or or dirty data, bad data. Uh, and so that's when, if we don't have good data, then we need to use some some human intuition. Yeah, so that's uh, perfect for our uh, next question from uh, Adiita uh, Indra Wang. Uh, so this learner is asking if there is any AI, uh, you know, tool or, or method that you're familiar with that can improve the, the forecast accuracy and you can share a little bit uh, about it. Um, yeah, that that becomes, again, a, a slippery slope from my aspect. I mean, you'll see a lot of people that say, yeah, AIML can do everything, but you know, maybe they're operating with a pristine data set. There's a lot of forecasting competitions where, yeah, the latest, greatest AIML model will will do good. OK, so there's a there's a couple things that I would suggest to the learner. One is make sure your statistical forecasts are doing everything you got they can for you. Right. Um, there was a forecasting competition several years ago called the M5, uh, a very famous series of forecasting competitions. And, you know, tens of, of thousands of people throughout the world vying for fame and glory and probably less than 90 percent of them could beat a very simple ensemble forecast of two exponential smoothing models, one that I could teach anybody in an afternoon. Right. Yeah. And so I do, I, I do remember that. Yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've so actually the, watched the, the whole competition. And yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's, is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, yes, if I had the data and there was a value proposition for that data, because you, what you're talking about is you're talking about the margins of increasing forecast error in a lot of cases. And the question is, is all that effort worth it? We are also seeing the question of, is the amount of, of power, is CPU power worth it? Because those models, can be very CPU intensive. And so they're, uh, at least currently, um, yeah, you, you need to be careful. I'm, I'm certainly not going to say, yeah, there's this one AI ML model that you can use and it's going to solve all your problems because it just doesn't exist. Yeah, actually, the name of the model, if I remember correctly, that you're referring to is the uh, theta model or theta model, T H E T A T A T T A. <clears throat> Uh, so I actually shared it on the chat for you guys if you want to check it out. But it's basically a, a, a little bit of a more sophisticated exponential smoothing. That's it. No crazy machine learning. That, uh, and yeah, one of the best uh, like forecast methods uh, out there. But of yeah. course, the, in AI ML, that there are many methods uh, like from random force to many many other uh, different uh, approaches. Um, and there is a whole literature into that, guys. If you want to yeah. get into, we should probably have to create a whole different course just for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and, and another course that really focuses on the on the data yeah. quality and availability, because you know one of the challenges that you run into is a lot of these will overfit data sets. Yeah. And so unless you're really, really uh, cognizant of you know your testing and training and your, your holdout stuff, um, you can run into problems. So I, I've, I've seen you know implementations of software packages that will go you know unnamed. Uh, where where someone just you know said oh this switch this you know neural net model and wow look at the in sample forecast fit it's going to be great and you can't extend it you know it it fits the sample well it doesn't fit the real life uh, very well not predictable 
So yeah, uh, yeah you got you to be careful with that. Make sure you got good before you get into AIML. Make sure you got really, really good data and and know what uh, yeah know what you're doing. All right, let's get into the next question because we have a lot. Uh, but just a clarification for yeah. for everybody. Uh, I think even here at MIT, like when we talk about AI ML, like if you, like we've had a lot of internal discussions. So if you think about it, like uh, simple exponential smoothing, it's kind of like a, a regression model, which at the end of the day is like the foundation of any AI ML <laughs> that you can think of. So you, like you can even say that if you're doing just a simple exponential smoothing, some how you're using ML. Uh, but that's a whole uh, topic. <laughs> like we, we cannot even agree between MIT researchers. So, yeah. um, so going to the next question, which I think is really interesting uh, and links very well with what you said, Jeff, uh, is from Gavin uh, Calarco. So, this learner is asking about the difficulty of you know getting uh, buy-in to to scale down forecasting and as an SNOP meeting. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. When those changes are necessary, what are some of the strategies that um, like our learners can use when they go into the the industry uh, to you know influence those conversations um, in a better way? Yeah, um, this is where you know the the number one indicator that I've seen of a successful SNOP process is executive buy-in. That the executive believes that this is the process, and that we do need to talk through these biases. Um, that occur, we need to have, um, you know, we need to measure the error metrics at each step of the forecasting process. So the number one thing you can do is find some type of upper level sponsor who who really understands what we're trying to do. I mean, we're not trying to discredit sales or marketing or, you know, sandbag for, for quotas or anything. We are truly trying to understand what the best customer demand signal is. Right. And once an executive gets that, they'll understand the override process and they'll understand why it's dysfunctional to continue to, you know, in many of the examples I've seen, keep adjusting the forecast up and up and up when there really is no statistical basis for it. And there is no you know, good qualitative basis. It's just like, well, we hope it's going to be there. Hope is not a strategy. Right. So you need to get buy in from the executives. You need to start taking metrics. Again, the, the forecast value added that I talked about at the beginning, that's very key because oftentimes we don't look at the forecast accuracy, how it matures through the process. All we see is the final number. We know the final number is bad. We start pointing fingers at one another and all of a sudden trust degrades, right? What you need to have is a, a statistical forecast to understand its accuracy, the accuracy of the overrides, start to explore why the differences are such. So getting the right metric, getting executive buy-in where this is the process and this is the process we have to follow. Um, those I think are, are probably the two key ones that, that I would say, if you're, if you're looking at implementing this process. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for, for the answer. And uh, going into another question, and I think we have room for, for a couple more, uh, cause it's been a super interesting discussion. Even uh, I think for us, uh, like peer, uh, peer to peer learning here. So, <laughs> Uh, it's from uh, Kevin Power. Uh, he's actually yeah. one of our uh, CTAs yeah. in SUNX. So thank you, Kevin, for for the question. So he uh, he's asking, um, like that many of the biases are actually introduced for self-serving reasons sometimes. Uh, so, um, how can we stand this behavior? You know, how can we like can we share some strategies about uh like that we used successfully in the past to to correct these kind of behaviors so i'm gonna start by my own experience okay. one of the main issues why this happens is what i mentioned before incentives uh when you have the wrong incentive system in an organization uh it's not only with uh, forecasting it happens with everything like if you go into um like i don't know the the stock market and the the s p 500 with the largest corporations in the world and you have a ceo that only makes money because of their uh short-term results you know quarterly results then you might have someone yeah making a lot of uh, like a lot of money for the company uh, in the first quarter second quarter third quarter uh, becomes a billionaire and then uh, then at the end of the year you see that oh okay things uh, went south uh, and now because uh, you, you can manage things in many different ways uh, yeah. and it's the same with forecasts as i said before if someone for example in, in the commercial team and i have experienced this before uh, only gets their bonus uh, by meeting the, the goal, the sales goal, they're always okay. going to under forecast because that's what they're going to. So in how do you set up this incentive system is definitely one uh, uh, way to go. 
Yeah. Any more um, like ideas? Yeah, um, a, a couple ideas. I'll, I'll give you probably two of my my favorite ones. One is, you know, why is the why is the quota or the annual operating plan unrealistic in the first place, right? And so my solution to that has always been, you know, not surprisingly for me through the SNOP process, but if I if my SNOP forecast process is going out. 18 to 24 months and you ask me in mid late year what is my forecast for 2025 going to be guess what i've been talking about that for the last several months it's in the snop process we've documented what our assumptions are we've got our forecast that now becomes the best baseline that we have for the annual operating plan and in fact in one of the implementations i did it I hate to say cut and paste, but quite literally it was because, you know, everyone in software closed your ears. We were using Excel. We had a really, really good SNOP process and we ran it in Excel. And we could we could take the, what the, the plan is for, for 25 cut and paste it to the annual operating plan. And that was pretty close, right? And so making sure you've got a realistic starting point versus you can imagine some companies just arbitrarily go, okay, we're going to grow five, 6%. Like, Where's the basis for that? How did you come up with that number? Just pull from air and, and look around. So from my perspective, if I've already already been looking at 2025 for the last several months, I know what it's looking like. We've discussed that, maybe not as much in depth as we have early in periods, but we've talked about it before. There shouldn't be a better basis on a on a units, you know, for how much we're gonna sell to the customer. The finances is, is totally different, but on a unit basis, I've got a really strong point of like, this is where, you know, in the absence, present course and speed, this is what our demand is going to be, right? So that's one. If we can be more realistic in our annual operating plan because we've used an SNOP process. The second one is one of my, uh, another one of my favorites, but awfully, often in a couple of companies, I've, I've gone and talked to the CEO. I was like, can we change some of these metrics that people are based on? For instance, forecast accuracy. Where is it normally going to? Well, someone in the forecasting field, right? Um, and so I like, what if we shared that with the, you know, the VP of operations and the VP of sales and put sales on the hook for forecast accuracy? Once you do that, now all of a sudden you mitigated some of the bias because as you know, the earlier comment, metrics matter, you get what you measure. If now all of a sudden the VP of sales has some skin in the game, now all of a sudden you've got a someone who's going to look at the overrides differently um certainly measuring that forecast value out of the component of the override not going negative is is a huge is a huge one right either be wise enough not to touch it or be certain enough when you know you touch it you've got a real high chance of success so those you know between having a realistic starting point and then also making sales and marketing accountable for the forecast accuracy I'll do the same thing with marketing, new product launch. Are you hitting the right product launch dates? Does your ramp up look right? Is your total number look right? So just making sure that you've got the best information going in there and, and holding the people that are making those decisions accountable for the decisions. But yeah, that's those are two of the things that, that I have used in the past that have been successful. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all of your uh, experience in the field because you're definitely the, the expert here. So it's um, 10.45 here uh, in Boston time, uh, Eastern time. So I think it's it's time to to wrap it up. We still have many more questions, but we don't have time to to answer them all. Um, just to end here, still we are gonna collect all these questions and who knows, later on we might be able to to follow up with some of you guys, because uh, I'm sure Jeff is gonna be super happy to, to see what you guys are interested in. Um, so yeah. this was a really special event. Uh, we truly appreciate the time uh, you, uh, you, Jeff, took to prepare this material uh, and uh, for our learners specifically. Uh, yeah. So yeah, and thank you so much everyone for joining uh, us today too. It's been a super insightful session and uh, the man forecasting people are saying, don't go. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we have to go sadly. Yeah. Uh, but before I, I, we I, said- I said, I, I'm available on LinkedIn. So yeah, go ahead yeah. and reach out to me. I, I, I love this stuff. Uh, that's nice. So um, yeah, before we say goodbye, I just want to remind the audience a couple of things. 
Uh, this was the second live event of the Spring Series that we are hosting, as you guys know. We are going to have uh, another session uh, later on uh, in the spring, so it's going to be late June, so expected in, in a month or so. Uh, we have our speaker uh, already selected. He's someone who has already been uh, contributing to the MicroMasters in the past, so you're going to love this um, this person. He, he, he's a great speaker, so stay tuned. We'll announce it soon. And Second and finally, uh, this was, uh, I mean, again, this is part of the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. So uh, not only SU1S has C3X, but there are three other courses that are right now open for enrollment, actually, uh, Supply Chain Design and Supply Chain Technology and Systems, and also SC0X. Uh, so there, Supply Chain Design and Technology and Systems uh, 2 and 4 are going to start in June. So stay tuned for that, and we, we encourage you to, to check them out um, and continue your path to complete the MicroMasters in, in SEM. Um, again, thank you so much for the support. Jeff, once again, thank you so much for joining. It was great. Uh, any final words from your side? No, just uh, you know, thanks for your attention. Thanks for the questions. Uh, happy to be here, and yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for the great vibe, <laughs> guys. Like, I, I've never seen so many questions. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.